liebe Freundin, mein lieber Freund, was für eine Veranstaltung. Wie viele Menschen am 29. August in Berlin waren, um ihre Meinung zu sagen. Robert F. Kennedy hielt eine Rede. Am nächsten Tag wurde er interviewt. This is Gabriel Albert von François, Robert Kennedy. Et j'ai ici aussi uh, Mary Holland, qui est professeur en voilà, human rights attorney, et qui sera avec nous. Uh, well, thanks week. a lot for, uh, for making yourself available so rapidly. Um, I actually was very impressed with the, uh, the speech that you gave um, yesterday um, and decided to actually make a paper in, the, in, uh, in François, who is in online media um, with an historic brand name, to speak about the message that you have. Probably my first question to you is, what, what is going on according to you in this world? Well, you know, I think there are people out there who believe that, um, suggest that the, you know, the entire pandemic was planned, um, that the, uh, the virus itself was genetically engineered that it was either accidentally released or a planned release, that it was weaponized somehow. And the truth is, I don't think anybody knows the answers to those questions. Um, but um, this is a crisis, and every crisis becomes an opportunity of convenience for authoritarian elements. And this one in particular is, has become an opportunity of convenience. So, uh, in the same way that 9-11 was, you know, every major trauma is used by, um, uh, by elites, um, whether it's military or uh, intelligence, apparatuses or whether it's telecom companies or in this case I think um, the, you look at you know there, you, you ask the question to Bono who's benefiting well, the people who are benefiting most are of course the Silicon Valley uh, billionaires who now control communications among the human race whether it's Amazon with Jeffrey Bezos or Zuckerberg or Bill Gates. And they're the ones who are continuing to make billions and billions while the middle class globally is obliterated. All social programs are bankrupted. And, you know, this transition to a really an oligarchical and plutocratic society also requires a tremendous amount of social control. And it's worrying that 5G installation is occurring at the same time, which will give them the capacity, uh, an unprecedented capacity for surveillance and control of human behavior, as well as uh, uh, an ability to harvest our data and turn us into consuming machines. So I think that's what's happening it doesn't matter whether it was planned or not what's what's happening is it's being utilized uh, to with to maximum effect to impose these impose obedience and social control on humanity and well th thanks a lot for that and um um now turning uh, you you've just spoken about who would benefit from that now turning to the media um you just had a big crowd in berlin yesterday you delivered a pretty amazing speech um, uh, that touches a lot of people and a lot of people, human rights and, and health. Um, nobody's covering it. Why is that according to you? Well, not only are they not covering it, but you know, I said in the beginning that what would happen was that they would pretend that all those people weren't there you know, that they would report that three or 5,000 people were there and that it was all Nazis. And today somebody just sent me a relative of mine, um, a brother-in-law who happens to be Jewish, sent me a, a headline from the Daily Coast, which is a big newspaper in the United States, saying that Robert Kennedy was in Berlin um, 
speaking at a demonstration for Nazis and anti-Semites. And uh, he was wondering if so, what happened to me between the last time he saw me and right now. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, it's pretty, it's really extraordinary how, you know, tight the clampdown is on censorship in the mainstream media, but then, you know, the social media that is benefiting from, from this um, quarantine, uh, you know, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook and Google. Google today is a vaccine company. It's making vaccines. It has, you know, a $750 million deal with Glaxo. It's making flu vaccines, it's making COVID vaccines. It's a subsidiary of its parent company, Alphabet and Verily. And it's censoring any information that's critical of vaccines or that's critical of um, government policies. And, you know, it's really, we're living in a world with, that is quite extraordinary. It's, it's Kafkaesque. It's something that we thought maybe would happen someday because we read George Orwell and Aldous Huxley when we were kids and Kafka, but we never expected it would happen so soon. And, uh, you know, I guess it's time to strap your boots on it and head for the hills if we have to, because they really have a chokehold on everything. On the media is extraordinary. Their ability to punish people, you know, um, their ability to, to, to say without any challenge that I was here to speak to Nazis. And when the big, the biggest stage ornament was a, was a, a photograph, a huge picture of Mahatma Gandhi, who is not a big Nazi, you know, icon, by the way. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the master of ceremonies was a black man from Ghana. There was a Hare Krishna, a Krishna monk on this stage. You know, this was the opposite of Nazism. It was people who love liberal democracy. It was people who love freedom and freedom of speech and, you know, and, and want to make sure that, um, that we continue to enjoy those freedoms. It was not, it, were, it was people who question authority which is the opposite of Nazism. Okay, that's good. And um, now you, you, talk, you spoke about, um, about vaccine um, and uh, about uh, the have some, uh, some form of investments and that will become a vaccine company. Are you worried about the development of these, a, a, these RNA vaccines? Well, you know, I can't believe that the Moderna vaccine will go anywhere because it's the clinical trials were so abysmal you had in the in the high dose group 21 percent of the people who got the vaccine had serious reactions meaning they either had hospitalizations or required medical attention any other medicine that had that kind of risk profile would be dead on arrival in addition to that, in the low dose and immediate dose groups, 100% of the people had reactions. Oh, you know, they're, they're contemplating giving this vaccine to children, to billions of children around the planet. A child has essentially zero risk from COVID. Why would you give them a medication where there's 100% risk of a reaction, of a bad reaction? And by the way, the people that they test this on are not your normal Americans. You know, they're, these are all, they only test them on the healthiest people, on people who have no diabetes, no rheumatoid arthritis, no Graves disease, Crohn's disease, people who've never smoked a cigarette, um, people who are not overweight. And, you know, now they're going to give them roll this out and try to give this vaccine to, you know, Americans who are 50 pounds over red weight and are eating, you know, donuts and, uh, and having diabetes and all these other problems. It's, uh, to me, that vaccine has so many problems. Uh, if it goes to market, I think it's going to be the end of all vaccines because there will be so many bad reactions to it that nobody will ever take a vaccine again. 
You're not really worried about the outcome because you think it won't even get to market yet. Well, I think that one, I'm worried still that, you know, there's, they have 200 of them in the pipeline. I think, you know, there, there are some places that have already passed laws that are going to mandate them once they get FDA approval, that they're automatically mandated. And that's insane. How can you mandate a product that you don't even know what it is yet? And particularly a medical intervention that you're giving to healthy people. This is not like a medicine that, you know, we're going to give it to a sick person and there's a risk, but, you know, the, the sick person could die from the illness. You're giving this to healthy people with zero risk of getting sick. And uh, so it's just, it's very, very twisted. But, you know, if we look back in human history, if you read history, there are many times in history where you had, um, you know, you had this kind of tyranny before. You know, I'm in, I'm in a country right now where, you know, that was the most enlightened, highly educated people on the planet in 1930. And one of the most democratic countries that ever existed. The best educated people in Europe. Probably the most tolerant, you know, which is why there were so many Jews living in Germany because they were fleeing the pogroms in the East and, you know, the Spanish, the Spanish Inquisition and all these other places. They ended up in Germany and they felt comfortable here. You know, they felt that they, just, they were part of the country. And, um, you know, the, the whole world went crazy. So I think tyranny has a, has a way, and totalitarianism has, uh, has a million ways to get, you know, into the national DNA. And, you know, I grew up in a world where people thought, because, you know, my parents were from the World War II generation, and they thought, it's something with the Germans. There's something wrong with the Germans, you know, but my father always said, it's not the Germans, it's all of us. It can happen anywhere. We've all, whatever the Germans have, we all got it. And if we're not careful, the same thing will happen here. It's not nothing to do with the Germans, it's something to do with all of us. So if, your, if your father was still amongst us, you think he would still say the same thing? Probably stronger? I think he would, I think he would be very, very worried about what's happening right now. And um, uh, Robert, I know you're, you're the chairman and, or president of, a, of a, an association regarding uh, the children's health defense. Um, if, if, if we turn towards our children, because I guess what, what you're probably worried about is the legacy world that we will leave to our children um, or the world that we're living. Um, what do you think we should do for our children? I heard you say we should buckle up or put our boots on and it's, the solution is going to come from the citizens? Well, listen, I think all the solutions ultimately are in democracy, you know, but in a functioning democracy which we don't have in the United States. We used to be a, an exemplary nation. Uh, we, we let the money into politics and our democracy got undermined it and now people lost faith in it. And you know, the regulatory agencies have been captured by the industries that they're supposed to regulate. The politicians have been corrupted. The votes don't count anymore. And you have these big industries that are now running the, the communication centers. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry controls network television. The, um, you know, and then you have the social media that has all of these agreements with telecom on 5G and with the big pharmaceutical companies. So we're seeing this medical cartel that has made these strategic alliance with social media and with telecom and with the intelligence agencies, by the way, and the military agencies. And we're really looking at the advent of a, uh, a very, very dark plutocracy. 
I didn't mean to. I, I hope I can say something to cheer you up at the end of this. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, it's, it's you, you know, the, the tone that you're saying is serious, but I think that there is some way out because you're saying that we have, the way out is democracy, so we have to find our way through democracy and through right. citizens. Now, and, that, and I think that's why the, the institutions that still remain most of the institutions that stand between a greedy corporation, a vulnerable little child, have been neutralized. You know, the, the Congress, the parliamentary system, those people have been bought by contributions. The regulatory agencies have been captured through all these mechanisms of agency capture. The press has been undermined and stolen from us. It no longer is, you know, it's no longer about telling the truth. It's about promoting orthodoxies, you know, government orthodoxies and corporate orthodoxies. And um, but we still have the courts. You know, they, in our country, the pharma, you can't, you're not allowed to sue a pharmaceutical company or injuring your child, but you can still sue them for fraud. And there are still ways that we can bring them to justice. And Oh, we have a we 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 have that last you know, redoubt. The last fortress of democracy is really you know that we do have a functioning judicial system, at least mainly functioning. And then we have, uh, and then we have the streets. You know, but as, as you pointed out, we had maybe a million people on the streets yesterday. And nobody noticed it somehow. <laughs> and you know, there's that old question that, that Emerson asked. Emerson asked if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, did it actually fall? And the question is, if a million people show up in the middle of Berlin and nobody writes about it, did it actually happen? And um, that is a good question because according to the rest yeah. of the world, you know, yeah. it didn't happen. Very, very good to meet you, and it was really enjoyable talking to you. Yeah, and thanks a lot uh, for your time, Santa, Mary, and, and Robert. And um, um, as I say, uh, if you can come to France, I definitely invite you. Thank, Thank you, you Xavier. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.